This rifle was the firepower of the Minuteman of the American Revolution. It was loaded, ready at a moment's notice for action against the enemy. And this represents firepower for the modern Air Force. Named Minuteman for its predecessor, it too is loaded and poised and ready. So meet the newest of Air Force weapon systems, the ICBM Minuteman. In the vast complexity of Cape Canaveral, work is progressing on a hole in the ground. As excavations go, it is relatively small. But that cavity in the face of the land, that hole we call a silo, is the forerunner of other silos, many others. Silos holding in their underground sentry boxes powerful missiles in great numbers. Their name, Minuteman, our ace in the hole, an important part of our overall strength whose purpose it is to deter any aggressor from launching an attack. Some of our strength will be carried beneath the sea in atomic-powered submarines. Much of our strength flies over and beyond the oceans. With the big nuclear punch in the bomb racks of the Strategic Air Command Special Delivery long-range bombers. And even their long arm is extended by missiles which can be launched 500 miles and more from any given target. We have the strike back power of intermediate range ballistic missiles, Thor, deployed in the United Kingdom. And on our own soil, we base the heavy missiles, the ICBMs, the upcoming Titan, and Atlas. The United States has no chip on its shoulder. Nine. We do not want war. Eight. But we are spending billions for weapons. Seven. Weapons we hope never to use. Six. Peace is expensive. Five. But that's no surprise. Four. Freedom has never been free. Three, two, one, zero. What it adds up to is this. Our national security is the largest and most important business in the world. It is also a competitive business. And the competition can be deadly. Costs are high because the stakes are high. And so getting more deterrence for the dollar means digging small silos underground today for our Minuteman missiles even though not very long ago, the word silo wasn't even in the military dictionary. Five years ago, our ballistic missile program was just beginning to feel its strength. But the responsible managers of our national security business were looking beyond successes of the immediate present. They knew that the costs of competition could easily soar beyond our ability to pay because the initial price tag of a missile is only a small factor. More than 70% of the total cost is for facilities, ground support equipment, and operating expenses. Our planners knew that those costs would be held down if we could devise missiles with solid fuel engines. There was, however, a problem. There were no solid fuel engines large enough even for a medium-range missile. They didn't exist not even on the drawing board. Compared to Atlas or Titan, the revolutionary new missile would seem small. It would have three power units or stages to deliver the nuclear warhead. Small silos for the small missiles would save on construction costs, on costs of elevators, erectors, and similar support equipment. Because solid fuel engines are relatively simple, almost complete automation could be achieved. 
and automation with a central control to monitor many missiles would reduce manpower by 85% and mean great savings in operating costs. More savings would be gained because solid fuel missiles can be kept in the alert position for long periods of time with minimum maintenance. And to protect them against attack, a greater degree of hardening would be possible with those small silos. This would ensure survivability, which in turn would permit installations being closer together. That, in turn, would drastically reduce logistic and communication costs involved in widely dispersed surface deployment. And the solid fuel missiles could be launched with less than a minute's warning, giving us almost instantaneous strike back power. And as concepts of our solid fuel weapon system were taking form, our first liquid fuel, heavy ICBM, Atlas, was successfully launched. On this 17th day of December 1957, missile men knew that Atlas and Titan would continue to be irreplaceable sinews of our deterrent power, ready to hurl their warheads as far as 9,000 miles or to boost satellites into orbit for our military and scientific projects in space. But the Minuteman weapon system, which would give us the total numbers to match our competition at a price we could afford, had to advance concurrently with all the other phases of deterrence. It advanced slowly at first, but after a series of successful tests, there was good reason to hope that a full-scale Minuteman could be successfully fired from a life-sized silo. In September 1958, the Air Force Ballistic Missile Division sets a deadline. They will have a full-scale Minuteman ready to be launched from a full-scale silo in exactly one year. And so, a 12-month countdown begins. And before that 12-month deadline can be met, there will be many thousands of tests in many areas. In December, the Department of Defense announces that Minuteman has become an approved weapon system program. The members of the Air Force Science Industry Team work on different aspects of developing the new weapon system and of finding the answers to the new technical problems involved in designing and building solid fuel rockets of unprecedented size. At New Mexico's Holloman Air Force Base, the world's fastest sled helps check the accuracy and durability of Minuteman's guidance system. May, as two-thirds of the countdown is completed, more progress is reported by members of that Air Force Science Industry Team. Boeing, up in Washington. Thiokol in Utah. Avco in Massachusetts. Hercules in Delaware. Air Force bases in New Mexico and Tennessee. In California, Autonetics and Aerojet General. It truly is an all-American team. Month nine, June. A child is born in nine months. Missiles take longer. And a missile must be ready to defend the nation the first day of its official life. Out on the Mojave Desert, it gets warm in July. 120 in the shade at Edwards Air Force Base, if you can find any shade. But time isn't measured by degrees of Fahrenheit. And on September 15, 1959, the exact date chosen a year earlier a full-scale model is ready to be fired from a full-scale silo. Nobody wants this first test model to fly its full trajectory. They merely want it to rise a few hundred feet from the silo and then, held captive, fall back to work. Test number one, completely successful. The deadline has been met. That's good. But Minuteman has many deadlines to meet. 18 tests are scheduled. But by May 1960, the unbroken string of successes permits the Air Force to cancel the last 10 test launches. That saves millions of dollars. And it saves time, even more precious than money. 
time, early morning of the 1st of February, 1961. At Cape Canaveral, the Air Force is ready for Minuteman's initial full-scale flight test. The first of the month is an appropriate date. For the first time in the history of the entire world, a solid propellant intercontinental ballistic missile would be fired. It would be the first ICBM to have its first flight test in a complete configuration. All three stages and re-entry vehicle separation would have to work in perfect synchronization the very first crack out of the box. Time of launch, 11 a.m. Within 15 minutes, the Air Force could report outstanding success. All three stages functioned as programmed. The re-entry vehicle hit the target as programmed some 4,600 miles downrange. A truly remarkable achievement, accomplished only two years after the Department of Defense gave the Air Force the official go-ahead for Minuteman. In less than another two years, SAC will have Minuteman missiles in underground sentry boxes. They may stand quiet and ready beneath the wheat fields in the heartland of our country. Or maybe they will protect the peace from the hidden valleys between great mountains and possibly a squadron of these up-to-the-minute minute men will help let freedom reign from somewhere beneath the desert. They will be doing the job they were designed to do, providing not only the most deterrence for the dollar, but also the numbers and almost instantaneous strike-back power, which, in the event of an attack, will help give our counter-force the strength to prevail and to win. Always ready, always on guard, Minuteman, our ace in the hole. Great Falls, Montana. Here is the latest in SAC ICBMs, a 54-foot Minuteman. Smaller than Titan or Atlas, the missile in this 26-wheeled, 108,000-pound trailer truck needs 20 different sets of gears to move it around. This missile packs a blast more than 30 times that of the Hiroshima bomb, quite enough for all but the most hardened targets. Minuteman is simple, where Titan and Atlas use liquid propellants with pumps, pipes, valves. Minuteman uses solid fuel. It needs no plumbing. Once placed in its silo, no one need go near a Minuteman for months. A small installation crew using the trailer can slide a Minuteman into place. The black object at right is an electronic alarm which substitutes for armed human sentries at the isolated Minuteman site. The most seasoned safe crackers would need hours to break into the concrete silo cover. Long before that, an armed patrol would descend upon them. Because it is simple and straightforward as a firecracker, ignite the solid fuel and it roars away, Minuteman is relatively inexpensive as modern weapons go. Plans call for a force of 950 of them, each silo miles from the next one. No single enemy missile could knock out more than one. The 150 sites in Montana are scattered over an area the size of Maryland. Because they are relatively simple, a flight of 10 minute men can be remotely controlled by just two men in an underground capsule, miles from any missile, which they may never even have seen. Each straps himself to his seat to maintain position in case of a surprise nuclear attack. A push of a button and an automatic checkout asks the missile questions. The missile, in turn, automatically answers with a tape-recorded voice. In effect, men are conversing with a machine. Here is the voice of the missile. Temperature abnormal. Guidance and control. Channel 11. You control how many missiles? I monitor 10 and control 50. Well, what does that mean, the difference between monitoring and controlling? Our setup includes five different flights within one squadron. Any pair of these flights can launch all 50 birds. 
Uh, on the other hand, I have only 10 missiles within my squadron to monitor and keep status on. Can you yourself launch any of these birds? Not by myself, sir. First of all, it requires two of us in this one capsule to agree. And secondly, we must get another vote, that is another pair of uh, control officers to agree in one other capsule within our squadron. How does that word come to you? And, and what takes place here, actually, if that dire word comes? Well, of course, uh, only the president can authorize the use of nuclear weapons. It goes down through the Joint Chiefs of Staff and then to SAC headquarters, of course, and then directly to us. Your contact is from SAC headquarters? That is correct. It's not a question of the president himself getting no. on the phone to you sitting out here. Our orders will come from SAC with no intermediate uh, headquarters uh, relaying. And of course, we must come to an agreement with the people in the other capsules within our squadron before anything can be launched. Well, this is a word of mouth agreement between you and the other capsule control center. That is correct. We must have received valid, authentic orders. And then what uh, security is there in uh, simultaneous pushing of buttons or whatever you do to actually get the missile out of the silo? Well, these buttons must be pushed simultaneously. In other words, by myself, I could not hit both buttons and submit a launch vote from this position. You couldn't get, in other words, from your position here over to the position at the other console? That is correct. It takes both of us to initiate one launch vote. That's why I assume you're separated as you are here. That's, that's correct. Do you know the targets on which the birds in your squadron are aimed? No, sir, I do not. But does anybody in the squadron or in the command know, or is that uh, secret held only in Washington, say? No one in the squadron knows. As for the command, uh, yes, I believe someone in the command knows. Is the weight of this awesome responsibility and being able to push that button prey on you? No, sir, it doesn't. Captain, can you tell us just how you would go about firing one of the birds out there in the silo? Is it one of those buttons up there you're going to punch? Well, Walter, it's not really a button at all. It's a key that has to be turned. This key is rigidly controlled, and it must be inserted in this thing over here, which is normally in the safe position, meaning that the cover itself is wired in place. The cover must be removed, the key inserted, and then the launch boat can be given, but only with the assistance of the deputy, who has another key and another uh, lock. And you have to turn those keys simultaneously. simultaneously. Yes, sir. And one other control position has to turn their keys simultaneously. So four of you have to turn the keys. That's right. Well, from the time you turn that key until the bird flies from the silo on its way toward target, how long does it take? 32 seconds. We're all cocked and ready. I notice you wear a sidearm. Oh, that's correct. Excuse me. Checklist. <laughs> Security violation. Buzzer release alarm number one on caution light. Noted. Reset. Check. Security violated. Outer security. LF4. Missile status indicator, launch your lap test. LF4. Accomplished. Time on that. Deputy, will you take step four and five, please? Shall we continue with what we're doing? As you can see, most of our actions down here are pretty well guided by a checklist. What was we that? Was a I want to say that was totally unrehearsed. Almost had me running for the elevator. We have a, an indication of a security violation. 
out at our launch facility number four, where we do have a missile. Uh, all of our facilities are electronically monitored. And when we have a penetration out there, we know about it here. We get a light indication, and we get the buzzer, which you heard. When that this occurs... That, uh, that you mean you've got a kind of electronic guard system if anybody passes through it, it sets off this alarm? That's correct. Well, now, how did you check that out? How do you know that somebody's not in that facility? I don't know this yet. Beg pardon? I don't know this yet. In accordance with our checklist, we accomplish one more step, which he's working on now, and then we dispatch a strike team out there of guards, security people. And they will arrive at the site within a uh, moderate amount of time, and they'll let us know what they find out. Sometimes wildlife or a bird stray into the electronic guard beams on a site. That's what it was this time. A bird curious about the strange structure man has placed in the middle of nowhere. The relief crew comes to take over alert duty. Ahead are 24 hours in a lonely bunker, but boredom is no problem. There is a steady stream of technical chores and homework. Every officer manning Montana silos is working toward a master's degree. Cooperative launch switch. Secured seal. Secured seal. Launch enable switches. Only when the relief has been checked out on the status of equipment will the keys that fire the missile be passed. And with them, an incalculable responsibility that goes with each little piece of metal. R-40 is ready to accept command. Roger, Deputy. On my count of three, we'll transfer launch keys. One, two, three. R-40 accepts command of Golf One. This awesome responsibility is shared by every SAC crewman, underground and in bombers overhead. SAC is by far the most powerful single military force of all time. If an aggressor did launch a blitz, enough of these missiles would survive, enough bombers would be safely in the air to deliver a nuclear retaliatory attack. This is what the world knows and understands. This is the mission that has been given to SAC, deterrence, to deter war, to keep the peace by confronting any would-be aggressor with near certainty of obliteration as a modern nation. constantly modernized to stay at the leading edge of technology. This Air Force Now special report documents some of our latest developments. SAC is making improvements in the survivability of its Minuteman missile force. A new suspension system plus strengthened silo covers will give each of its 1,000 Minutemen greater protection and stability. In addition, the Minuteman's electrical systems will be protected against the energy effects of a nuclear blast. Minuteman 3 marks a significant increase in missile technology. It has greater range, better accuracy, and it can carry up to three MIRVs. Each MIRV can be set for a separate target. A new remote targeting system will allow a two-man crew to target any of its flight of 10 Minutemen in about 36 minutes. These changes ensure that Minuteman remains a credible deterrent. And so does this next idea. In the fall of 1974, we launched a Minuteman missile from a C-5 flying at 20,000 feet. Parachutes pulled the missile off its cradle, out of the airplane, and into an upright position. At about 8,500 feet, its engine was started. It fell another 800 feet before the engine's thrust lifted it above 20,000 feet where the propellant was exhausted. We put just enough propellant in the missile to test the concept. We weren't trying to hit anything. But the test off the coast of California proved that it is technically feasible to have an air mobile ICBM. The Minuteman was a three-stage solid propellant intercontinental missile. It began to enter SAC in 1962. By 1967, it had reached a force level of 1,000. Missile silos were built in remote locations. They offered instantaneous response to an enemy's first strike. Missiles also offered new challenges to Air Force personnel. These range from technical expertise to 
and the psychological ability to adapt to life in a silo. Missile crews on alert had to be prepared to survive below ground level. The demands placed on families through stress and separation were equal to those long experienced by bomber crews on alert. Hundreds of officers used slack time to take correspondence courses. Cards were a last resort. Missile crews took pride in their work. They knew it was critically essential. Practice alerts happened with nerve-jarring frequency. The Air Force realized the need to maintain performance levels and morale in this difficult environment. Incentives were offered. Competitions, recognition, and awards gradually build a spirit among the missile force to equal that of bomber crews. The latest and most accurate American ICBM is the Peacekeeper. Taken together, the ICBMs, the air launch cruise missiles, and the traditional bombers make up what the Air Force calls a triad for deterrence. Establishment of this triad was expensive and time consuming, but ultimately successful. It created the enormous pool of physical and intellectual capabilities that brought about the Air Force domination of space through satellite-based military systems. The intercontinental ballistic missile did not replace the man bomber, but it did create a world of new requirements in research, recruitment, training, and career development. Liquid rocket fuel proved dangerous to handle, and the Air Force pressed forward on safer, solid fuel rocket engines. Minuteman strategic missile used solid propellant and was much more compact than the Titan. It was originally envisaged as a mobile missile, but those plans were abandoned to achieve operational status more quickly, which it did in 1963. The Minuteman formed the backbone of the U.S. Air Force's strategic deterrent force for over two decades. Deterrence is the essence of the strategic nuclear force. This strategy means deterring the enemy armed forces from attacking with their strategic weapons, knowing full well that they would be subjected to a devastating retaliatory blow. The Minuteman remains a critical element of the American deterrent force, with some 950 missiles still in service. The Minuteman III missile was then deployed in the 1973 to 75 time frame. It is the newest uh, Minuteman missile. It uses the multiple independently tar retargeted uh, reentry vehicle, or MIRV, and uh, that missile gives us a great deal of capability that the previous generations of Minuteman did not. What made the Minuteman missile survivable was the way it was based. Dispersed launch silos and launch control centers were dug into the ground and then hardened to protect the missiles from nuclear attack. Because of this basing method, the Minuteman was nicknamed America's Ace in the Hole. The Peacekeeper, originally codenamed MX, is the largest and newest ICBM to enter U.S. Air Force service. It incorporates the latest technology